Good morning. My name is Laren Hurst. Thanks so much for being here. Welcome to San Ramon Seventh Avenue Church, and uh, we just—it's awesome that we can worship together in this way. And I just want to um, welcome you, uh, but also I want to share a little verse for you. This is taken from Psalms fifty-one, ten, and it says this: "Create in me a pure heart, O God." and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. This is such an awesome text because David is asking God to give him a pure heart. And I have to tell you, that's kind of an awesome prayer. There's so much in the world that is complicated and, and not very pure, let me tell you. And it's easy to get distracted by so many different things. And our prayer needs to be, give me that purity, give me that pure heart. Give me that spirit, a steadfast spirit. And don't cast me from your presence and take your Holy Spirit from me. Keep that coming. Keep that coming. That, that still small voice, those nudges where that keeps your attention on good things. That's what the Holy Spirit does for us. And restore to me the joy of your salvation. And grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Such an awesome text. And one with which we should really strive for. It's a prayer that we should pray. Create in me a clean heart. Sustain me with your love. Give me a steadfast and willing spirit. Such an awesome thing, an awesome request, an awesome ask. Thanks so much for being here again. And uh, we are so happy that uh, things are going well. Um, the San Ramon Seventh Avenue Church has a number of ministries that are alive and doing things. Last week we had a uh, blood drive that that was able to help so many people, and uh, uh, we I think had 17 pints, but we um, entertained 31 people. And um, what we ended up with is um, the ability for three one pint of blood can help three lives possibly save three lives and that's really incredible our project uplift is going great thanks to Debbie and Isaac and um, things are going really well there as we minister to Pleasant Hill Adventist Academy lifting up those teachers and and kind of promoting uh, Christian education and uh, so a lot of good things happening here and um, I'm just so glad you're able to participate with us in this way Happy Sabbath and uh, enjoy.
of my Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Amen. Making a difference in the world. Coming up next, we'll find out how one church made plans to make a difference. The church told their pastor A church told their pastor they wanted a direct mission project from one church to another. Trying to decide what mission, mission project to sponsor, the board started with prayer. An elder grabbed the globe in the office and took it for a spin. He asked another member to place a finger on the globe. It landed near Lake Victoria in the nation of Kenya. They investigated and discovered that there was a church in that place that met under the trees because they had no church structure. After working out logistics, the church started raising funds for the project. Within six months, the church has raised enough funds to build a church for their sister congregation. Representatives from the church visited Africa when the church there was completed and ready to be dedicated. At the dedication service, the conference man asked the pastor, why did the church in America choose this church? The pastor replied, we prayed, we asked for direction, and God pointed the way. Did you know this church in Africa prayed that God would send a miracle? God knows our prayers and delights in bringing our prayers to life. Some of the prayers due from time to time require financial assistance. Today's undesignated offering will go towards our local church budget, which can be used to help make our prayers a reality. Additionally, at times our own members need assistance. To contribute to this fund, mark your donations, membership care. I want to uh, read from Malachi 3, verse 10, and it reads, bringing the whole tithe into the storehouse that they may be food, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the financial blessings in our lives and return a portion of it to you. And we accept your promise to open the floodgates and bless us with, our, with your generosity. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you. Enjoy your Sabbath.
All right. Well, good morning and happy Sabbath to everyone who's joining us via live stream today. We are having a, uh, a special communion type service today uh, in our building, in our facility. So we're not live streaming uh, that particular service, but we are putting a service online because we want those who are not able to join us in person uh, to be able to receive a blessing from the service. And I hope you've received that blessing thus far as we have worshiped the Lord with song and prayer and, uh, and also in giving. Uh, today is a special day at the San Ramon Valley Seventh-day Adventist Church. We're having communion for the first time in, in years, actually. The first time that I've, since I've been here as pastor. And it's a, it's a special, special event that we're going through. And, and uh, those of you who are not able to join us, again, we're not streaming it. But we will have pictures that will be available on our, uh, on our newsletter that goes out every week. Uh, if you're not part of that newsletter, please uh, contact us. You'll see our contact information at the end of the broadcast. Uh, please send an email in, and we'll be happy to add you on our email distribution list so that you can also participate in our announcements and things that are happening with San Ramon Valley. Before we go any further, please join me for a word of prayer as we uh, present and go through the word of God. Bow your heads with me, please. Father in heaven, I pray that you would open my lips so my mouth may declare your glory. I pray, God, that everything that is said, that is done, will continue to be for your honor. May we leave this place having heard your words and not my own. May we leave this time, this space that we have uh, set aside to, to open and um, hear and understand the word of God. And may it become crystal clear as your spirit moves through me and through those who are hearing. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. The title of my message today is simply, Nothing But a Jar of Oil. 
nothing but a jar of oil. We're going to be looking at 2 Kings chapter 4 as we discuss this aspect of nothing but a jar of oil. Now before I uh, moved to California, I spent a few years living in the Seattle area of, um, of Washington. And this didn't happen directly in Seattle, but if you, as you go over to the uh, Olympic, um, over the Olympic Mountains into the peninsula area, one of the great natural resources in Washington that you will see is their endless supply of evergreen trees. Evergreen trees. It's beautiful. Isn't that a beautiful photo of uh, the kind of the Seattle area? I, I used to think that, that these trees were just used for lumber. But what I learned is that these trees serve many different purposes. Some are used for furniture. Some other types of evergreens are used for Christmas trees, as you can imagine. Some of the evergreens that are, you, that are there are, have medicinal purposes, and, and others are, are used even for cancer medications. And of course, there are some trees that are used to build homes, right? And uh, some that are used for uh, musical instruments, such as violins. With so many uses, I wondered to myself how the forest landowners were able to keep an endless supply of trees. It seemed like the trees just kept growing and growing as they were cutting them down. And yes, there are acres and acres of land, but after centuries of cutting down these trees, the question I had was, wouldn't the supply run dry? Then I learned about the Forest Practice Act passed on January 1 of 1946. This law requires that Washington loggers are uh, to plant trees to replace the logs that they had harvested. In 1900, the U.S. Forest Service director's name was Gifford Pinchot, predicted that the U.S. would face a timber famine by 1940. This simply meant that, in his estimation, that we would run out of natural resources, the natural resource of wood, that the evergreen trees supply. Now, in order to prevent this from happening, there, that law was passed and it required the planting, again, the planting of new trees after cutting a portion of the forest down. Now, since that law was passed, you can observe portions of the forest, and I've, I've done this as I've had the opportunity to drive through the forest uh, over there in Washington. You can see portions of the forest are new trees, while others are larger trees, while others are medium-sized trees. And what we see there is it seems like there is an endless supply of trees in Washington. In fact, the tree supply was multiplied as a result of the passing of this law. Now, this amazing multiplication of timber resources reminds me of a story in the Bible. I gave this illustration for a reason. It reminds me of a story uh, found in 2 Kings chapter 4, but the supply was not trees, but oil. In our story today, we're going to see and understand a God who, will take the re who takes the resource of oil and multiplies it to meet the need of a woman. This same God who multiplied the oil for this woman is ready to multiply blessing into your life. This same God who multiplied the oil for this woman is ready to grow your faith by supplying plenty where there is nothing. Let's learn more about the God we serve and, and how he desires to multiply uh, blessing, multiply so many things within our lives by turning to the book of uh, 2 Kings. We're looking at 2 Kings, and we're going to look at uh, chapter 4, 2 Kings chapter 4. Now, before reading the text, I want to go ahead and, and describe the, uh, the situation of what's What's happening here? 2 Kings chapter 4, we see the great prophet Elijah, previous to that, was taken up to heaven in a whirlwind of fire. That's in 2 Kings chapter 2. Now, what we see is Elijah was one of the greatest prophets in the history of Israel. And Elisha was his apprentice. Now, before Elijah was taken to heaven, he asked Elisha what he could do for him. He says, what can I do for you as your the mantle is being passed unto you. And Elisha immediately knew what he wanted. He said, what I want is to be passed a double portion of God's Spirit. I want a double portion of God's Spirit to rest over me as, as, as I attempt 
to, to be even half the prophet that you were. That wish, that desire was granted. Elisha became a, a prophet with greater personal impact over the people than Elijah. Now, the relationship between Elijah and Elisha can be compared to the relationship between John the Baptist and Jesus. Now, Elisha's name, let's take a look at that. Elisha's name, Elijah's name, I should say, means the Lord is my God. That's Elijah. Elijah means the Lord is my God. And the mission of Elijah was to turn the hearts of the people back to God, to have them understand truly and say with a sincere heart, the Lord is my God. This is very much similar to John the Baptist, who was called to prepare the way uh, for Jesus and turn the hearts of a rebellious people towards God so that they could say within their heart through his preaching, the Lord is my God. Now, Elisha, his prayer, his um. The, the one who came after him, the one who followed him. His name means, the Lord is my salvation. The Lord is my salvation. Now, after Elijah left, his primary job as a prophet, Elisha's job, was to perform miracles for the people personally and to preach a message of God's love. This was very similar to the message that Jesus preached when he was here on this earth. So John the Baptist, preceding Jesus, pointed people to God, and then Jesus intersected into, into their lives to show them who God is. That's just how Elijah and Elisha worked as well. Elijah, were, his job was to bring the hearts of the people back to God, and as their hearts were brought back, Elisha came into the picture, and he intersected directly into their lives so that they could understand who God is on a personal level. Elisha's message was very similar to the message of Jesus. It was a message of freedom from sin and bondage sent out to a world hungering for hope and relief of all the pain that they were going through, whether it be physical, whether it be emotional, whether it be psychological. This is the message that we're going to be looking at today in 2 Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4 is what we're going to be looking at. Let's start by taking a look at verse 1. 2 Kings 4, 1. Here's what it says. I'm reading from, as you can see from the slide, the New International Version. And here's what it says. The wife of a man from the company of the prophets cried out to Elisha, your servant, my husband, is dead. And you know that he revered the Lord. But now his creditor is coming to take my boys as his slaves. This woman's husband, now passed away, was a prophet. He was a God-fearing prophet. He, he was belonged to the school of the prophets. And so Elisha knew him well. He, he was uh, a, a, a classmate, if you will, of Elisha. And they all studied under Elijah. So Elisha knew this man and his family and his sons very well. And, and now this woman came to Elisha, knowing that he was now to succeed Elijah, and she was in a very desperate situation. She knew that if she could call on Elisha, that he could at least offer some good advice on what she was to do. The widow was now a single mom. She had two boys and... and her husband, for whatever reason, uh, uh, left her so deep in debt that her only recourse was to sell her sons into slavery. Now, from reading about the widow's situation, we, we can imagine that she's likely at this time experiencing so many deep emotions, frustration, exhaustion, anxiety, stress, hopelessness, loneliness. You know, friends, we live in a world today where, where these feelings seem to be more common than they were even five years ago. Well, we're coming to the end of COVID-19, but, it, but its effects are, are still there on, on individuals. Still a major issue in our world, causing us to feel these type of emotions. Like this woman, many are feeling stressed and, and burdened and, and burned out by all the trials of life. 
if this is your story, we need to follow the example of this woman. She called on this man whose name was Elisha, whose name means God is my salvation. And we have access to Jesus, who is the salvation that God sent to us, and whose name means the same thing, salvation. God is my salvation. Jesus, who is the way and the truth and the life. You know, as I think of Jesus and, and who he is and what he represents, I'm reminded of Acts chapter 4, verse 12. This Bible story tells is with Peter and John, and they're called before the council of Jewish leaders. They were accused of proclaiming the name and the power of Jesus. They were, they were accused of, of showing people how Jesus had intersected into their personal lives. And because they dared to do this, they were arrested. And because they shared the power of the resurrection of a people who needed hope, they were placed before the leaders. Now, as they were interrogated by the rulers about their preaching and the miracles that they performed, Peter, the apostle, that, uh, the apostle of Jesus, became filled with the Holy Spirit, and he declared the following words. He said, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind which, by which we must be saved. The salvation spoken of in the text that you're looking at right now does not refer only to the salvation we receive when Jesus comes to take us home. Jesus wants us to experience the gift of salvation in the here and the now. He wants us to come. He wants to come close to us. He wants to comfort us through our sorrows, through our pains, and through our struggles. He wants to help us navigate through the uncertainty of life. You know, Jesus shows us, he illustrates this to us in John 8, 36, where he says, So, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. He uses this word, indeed, and we see that it has a specific meaning. When he says indeed, it means by fact, by reality, by certainty. You can be assured that you will be made free if the Son sets you free. What this verse is proclaiming is that when you call on the name of Jesus in the midst of your struggle, or when you call on the name of Jesus during the course of your daily life, even as things are, are going well, he offers the reality of peace and freedom. He frees us from the, the domination of, of sin over us, the un, uncertainty of, of life and the way things are going, the, the pain, the, the guilt, the anxiety, and, and hopelessness that we experience through many situations and circumstances. In 2 Kings chapter 4, this widow lost all hope, and she called upon Elisha. She was in a desperate situation just as many of us may be in a desperate situation. And I urge you to call on the name of Jesus. This woman was looking for salvation from her difficult circumstance. She was facing the loss of her sons to slavery. Verse 2 tells us what happens next. And, and this conversation is very important. Let's take a look at verse 2 of 2 Kings chapter 4. And here's what it says. Elisha, Elisha replied to her, how can I help you? Tell me, what do you have in your house? Your servant has nothing there at all, she said, except a small jar of olive oil. The question was simple. What shall I do for you? It's a powerful question because it shows the willingness of Elisha to intersect into this woman's life and to do everything in his power to help her. It is the same question that Jesus asks us as we turn our lives to him. What shall I do for you? Elisha sees her needy, he hears her cry, and now he's ready to act on her behalf. Elisha, in fact, he's, he's opening himself up to be of service to this woman who is in desperate need of help. You know, his words remind me of the God we serve. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, 
Here's what Paul says about uh, God and how he will respond when we open ourselves up to him. It says, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. In this text, it says that he will meet or that he will supply all your needs. What he's saying, friends, is, is that God is going to fully supply everything you need. He won't just supply all your needs, but he will fully supply everything that you need. And this includes things that you don't even realize that you need. You notice the difference between needs and wants. And a lot of times we want things, but we don't really understand what we need. But the Bible tells us that God is able to supply all we need. So sometimes when we pray and, 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 and we're expressing our wants to God, God goes beyond our wants and says, I'm not going to supply your wants. I'm going to go beyond that and supply what you need. And a lot of times our needs intersect with our wants, and we don't even realize it until God supplies it. When we are, are on our knees asking God to, to heal our, our hurting body, He will heal our troubled mind as well. When God is, God is looking ahead and anticipating what you will need even before you realize that you need it. In this story of Elisha and the widow, we learn how he does this. Let's continue with our narrative. We're going to start. We're going to go to uh, to verse um, three, and here's what it says. It goes. The narrative is now continuing as Elisha is now intersected into her life and said, "How can I help you?" And she said, "This is what I need." Verse three says, "Elisha said, go around and ask all your neighbors for empty jars. Don't ask for just a few." Then go inside and shut the door behind you and your sons. Pour oil into all the jars, and as each is filled, put it to one side. She left them and shut the door behind her and her sons. They brought the jars to her, and she kept pouring. When all the jars were full, she said to her son, bring me another one. But he replied, there is not a jar left. Then the oil stopped flowing. Elisha starts this narrative by asking, what do you have to work with? I need to know what you have to work with. Go to your neighbors and, and, and get some jars. The, the widow says, I, I don't have much. I'm nothing but a jar of oil. What we need to understand about oil is that olive oil was a miracle ingredient in Elisha's time. It was a staple of, for everyday life. It was useful for fuel. Useful for lotion, for medicine, for cooking. Without oil, without olive oil, life would be miserable. Olive oil was not a convenience. It was a necessity. This woman was crying out for a dire need. She was in danger of losing her sons. And she was in danger of losing her source of heating, of light, of medicine, and of food. The Bible tells us she had a jar of oil. You know, friends, this amount of oil was, was barely enough for her to, to clean her feet. It was just a tiny amount. But that small amount of oil was enough for God to work with. What do you have in your house? What do you have in your life? What small amount do you have? What resources do you have available for God to work with? You know, friends, many times in our lives we, we prevent and resist the, the action of God in our lives because we don't believe that we have enough for him to work with. We're not talented enough. We don't have enough money. We don't have enough time. We don't have enough resources. We, we don't have enough to give to God. We, we are looking for God to perform some mighty miracle when all he wants to do is work through the little resource he has to show you that it's not about what you have, it's about whom you believe in. The resource that we need to have, friends, is faith. What we learn from this story is, is that faith requires action. 
She may have believed the, the words of Elisha, but she needed to go out and, and get those jars from her neighbors and, and then start to fill them up. You know, friends, Elisha could have just given her enough money to pay the creditors, and, and I'm sure she would have been grateful. Elisha could have, could have gotten on his knees, lifted his hands towards heaven, and prayed the most eloquent prayer you've ever heard, and, and petitioned God, and, and prayed that problem away, and I'm sure she would have been happy. But instead of, of, of snapping his fingers and, and giving her an, an instant fix to the problem, what Elisha did is he allowed her to become part of the miracle. She didn't just see God work. She partnered with God in the work of solving her problem. God used her own hands to perform the miracle which provided for her family and kept her sons out of bondage. You know, friends, when we exercise a, a mustard seed faith, God is able to perform great acts of power through that tiny belief. Let's go to the verse where this is being talked about in Matthew chapter 17, verse 20. Here's what Jesus says about this faith. He says, uh, he sa it starts by saying, he replied, because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. What I want us to understand, friends, is, is even though he's talking about the size of a mustard seed, Jesus is not directing our attention to the size or the quantity of our faith. He's not talking about the strength of your faith. He's talking about the object or the focus of your faith. And that's why the size, the, 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 the quantity, the strength of it doesn't matter. Because if you're focusing it in the right direction, God, towards God, he's going to take care of the situation. Our faith is only as strong as the object in which it is placed. The widow placed her faith in the words of Elisha, that Elisha was hearing from God, and, and she was determined to follow his words. She was quick to obey the request, which, which may have seemed ridiculous, and the result was more oil than she knew what to do with. In the same way, when we put our focus on Jesus and follow his words, he gives us more grace. He gives us more power. He gives us more strength. He gives us more patience to deal with any situation that may come our way. When the widow acted on her faith and, and said yes to God's plan, said, yes, Elisha, I will follow what you're telling me. I will follow the agenda of God. I will, I will go about and, and gather these jars and, and fill them up. I'll do it. When she made it a point to follow God's plan, she experienced a miracle. Oh, friends, in your daily walk of life, God may be asking you to act in faith so that he could provide the miracle in your life. He's asking you to, to collect jars so that he can fill them to overflowing, to believe in his plan and to follow his agenda. You know, friends, as I think of the story and I look at it, she filled the jars, but, but I want you to understand something. Where did she get the jars from? Where did the jars come from? The Bible tells us it they came from her neighbors. In order to grow in grace and the full measure of faith in Jesus, we need to realize that we're not in this alone. Elisha could have just done it himself. He could have just included the woman. But part of the faith journey was for her to include her community in her problem, to allow them to help her build her faith. Her neighbors provided the jars which were used to increase her faith. In the same way, our brothers and sisters in Christ were given to us to help us through situations as well. Sometimes we need to reach out and ask for prayer. We need to, we need to ask for those jars. We need to reach out and ask for counsel. Sometimes God is using our, our, uh, our church family or, or friends 
as a resource to do his good pleasure in our lives. You know, friends, as we go through life, let us remember that our mustard seed faith has the power to unlock the mercy and grace of heaven in our lives and in our experience. We need only believe, receive, and obey. You know, it's amazing what God was able to do with nothing but a jar of oil. Nothing but a jar of oil. But this narrative is not just a story of a woman with no oil. Friends, it's my story, and it's your story. The one When we are on our last leg, when we're in need of a boost, when we feel like we can't go on any further, God will provide us with provision in the midst of problems as we faithfully believe. And again, it's not about the quantity. It's about the focus. As we put our faith completely in Him, He will empower us to do things beyond what we can imagine. May God bless you. May God guide you. May God empower you in the face of whatever adversity, whatever problem you're going through in life. May He put you in a position that you will experience triumph through faith in Jesus in the presence of Jesus. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we're just so thankful for this story, this narrative found in 2 Kings chapter 4. With nothing but a jar of oil, you were able to do amazing things. As this woman submitted herself to the words of Elisha, Lord, I pray that we would submit ourselves to the words of Jesus, that we would al allow him to come and intersect within our lives, Lord, so that we can experience a mustard seed faith. So, Lord, we ask that you guide us, bless us, be with us, and keep us faithful until the end. Thank you, Lord, once again, for sending your Son to die for us and for sending your Spirit to live within our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious to you. And may he give you peace in the name of Jesus, the author and finisher of, and of our faith and the Prince of Peace. God's blessing on you, and we will see you next week.